together. It turned out to be quite a free ring circus, as we were talking about. And I'd like to thank my team at uh, Learning Policy Institute, who uh, facilitated uh, an enormous amount of work getting out our very first report from our new institute, uh, and the team at PACE and AIR. Uh, and uh, it's great to see so many old friends and new here really thinking about and diving in to solve uh, this uh, problem that we are hopefully going to get ahead of. So uh, I want to also note that the report that we um, did at LPI, uh, co-authored by Roberta Ferger uh, and Patrick Shields and Lee Sutra and myself, is on our website if people want to uh, download copies for other purposes. The first part of the story is what Patrick Shields started us off with this morning, which is, here we are, deja vu all over again, in terms of these emerging shortages. And I will say, having come into teaching in 1973, uh, so I'm going to date myself, uh, where I came in and passed the breath test in Pennsylvania, that is when they hold the mirror up and you breathe, it fogs, and they know that you're alive, uh, this deja vu goes back many, many times. And I was talking to my good friend Dwight Bonds, who was running teacher core programs uh, here in California with other folks uh, at that time and responding to those shortages. Um, so we've gone through cycles of these kinds of needs. And the only times we have been successful in solving these problems is when we've had policy strategies, powerful policy strategies to address them. Uh, but I do want to remind us where we were. The bad news is that we're repeating ourselves. The good news is that we've learned something from those earlier eras about what we should do, and we ought to get about the business of doing it right this minute. We do not have any time to waste. So just to vivify for a moment, uh, where we were in about 2000, uh, end of the 1990s, early 2000s, uh, as we had uh, up to 40,000 teachers on emergency credentials, something that we documented in the Williams v. California School Finance lawsuit, the distribution of those teachers to uh, students in high poverty schools and high minority schools uh, and those in the lowest achievement decile uh, was significantly higher than to the students in low poverty, low minority, uh, higher achieving schools. And we've heard a lot of statistics this morning, and if you kept up with all of that, congratulations to you. I could go on, but it's important to see the human faces of the kids who are experiencing what we just heard about on the panels this morning. Uh, cycles of substitute teachers, uh, here we are in the eighth largest economy of the world, in a place that ought to be competing with first world countries for educational leadership. And we're having a conversation about whether it's a little bit better to have an untrained continuous teacher than a string of substitute teachers, or whether it's a little bit better to have somebody who's uh, going to stay for one year uh, rather than only a few months, when we ought to be having the conversation that they're having in those top achieving countries around the world, Finland and Singapore and uh, many others, uh, about how we ensure that all of the well-prepared teachers we have in our classrooms continue to grow and learn and take our children to greater heights. So it's important that we learn from the past. Uh, in the Williams versus California lawsuit, uh, that was brought about that period of time. Uh, this point was made uh, by researchers who looked across the schools where there were so many underprepared teachers. Across most schools, teachers of English language learners felt least prepared. One teacher explained that she was assigned to a sheltered class when she first came to the school and thought it was for foster care students from homeless shelters. She didn't know what sheltered instruction even was which is the fundamental aspect of teaching English learners uh, in the California system. 
Several reading teachers also had no preparation in reading instruction, were teaching students who were reading well below grade level. Teachers and experience, of course, accelerates teacher burnout. We've heard the statistics about that today. Teachers were reflecting on what they saw in their schools. Uh, one teacher reported that there was another who was considering a career change and came in and taught the special ed class for a year. During the time she was taking one or two courses out at uh, State College to get her credentials, she had a miserable year, felt unqualified. It was hard watching her teach. It was hard to watch her kids function in the room. Another teacher talked about yet another classroom and said the kids were going to struggle, and we discussed the fact that teachers received them the next year would have a difficult time with those students because of what they had been through the prior year. And one of the points that they were making was that not only were the teachers struggling without support, but also other teachers were encouraged to leave because of the spillover effects of the teachers who were coming in and underprepared uh, to teach kids. So we are already seeing this repeating itself in classrooms across the state. It's quite clear that the extent of the problem will get larger if we don't have an aggressive policy response to it. Uh, and we're also living with the effects of the funding system that we had before LCFF uh, and before the new Prop 30 money, and we haven't yet gotten beyond uh, where we were a few years ago. In fact, we still haven't replaced all of the money that was cut. So we're gradually, you know, clawing our way back to where we were. But in 2009, uh, we had a situation where the salaries in California varied dramatically. Uh, even for teachers at the same degree level and step on the salary schedule, you could earn uh, more than twice as much in some districts and others. And if you adjusted it for cost of living differentials, it got worse, and the ratio was three to one. That hasn't completely gone away, even though it is positive that the districts that are receiving more money under LCFF are able to begin to catch up, and they are the districts that have the higher need students, uh, but they haven't completely caught up, so we have these salary differentials. So it's not just average salaries that are a problem in recruiting and retaining teachers. It's the relative salary that a district has vis-a-vis uh, -vis others in their labor market. At that time and today, low salary districts served higher need students, more minority students, and more English learners. And in even a very small area, like the Bay Area, you could see that uh, some districts were paying beginning teachers, minimum salaries, uh, that were $20,000 more than other districts were paying. So where are you going to go if you're a beginning teacher? You're going to go where the salaries are the best, and if you're in a district that does not have a competitive salary schedule, you're going to have struggles hiring every kind of teacher that we've talked about. So what do we know about what matters in recruiting and retaining teachers? Obviously, the attractiveness of the profession matters. Uh, do people feel like they want to go in and it will be a good place to work and be creative and, and live? And we've struggled with that in recent years. Compensation matters. More at the beginning for recruitment. Uh, and then uh, other aspects of compensation like can I get, do I have enough to buy a house? Can I send my kids to college? Those kinds of things matter later. Preparation matters. In fact, as you heard, teachers who are fully prepared before they enter uh, are half as likely to leave, both in the first year of teaching and actually over the first five years of teaching. So uh, when you're prepared, you come in, you feel like you know what you're doing, the better prepared you are, like teachers in year-long residency programs who've got a whole year under their belt, um, feel much more confident, they are much more competent, and they're much more likely to stay in the profession. Uh, mentoring matters, and we learned that from the early days of the Beginning Teacher Support and Assessment Program, uh, where the uh, re retention of beginning teachers uh, went substantially uh, higher because of the high quality mentoring they re received, and you've heard about how that's becoming a little tattered around the edges in a number of districts. And then, of course, teaching conditions matter. And it's not just things like, do you have enough paper and books, and is the building safe and you know warm when it should be and cool when it should be, although all those things matter. 
Uh, it does matter, you know, what your pupil load and class size is, but at the very top of what teachers talk about when they talk about teaching conditions is whether their principal supports them, whether they have a good set of long-term colleagues that they can plan and work and grow with on a regular basis, whether they feel supported, listened to, respected, and enabled to be efficacious in the work that they've committed to do. Very few people come into teaching for the money. Um, they come in because they want to be successful with kids. They need enough money to survive and succeed in the uh, economy, but uh, it's really about whether they can be effective. That keeps people there. And what do successful states and countries do? Well, I'm finishing a study right now of international teaching policy in five countries that are, have highly developed systems and are high achieving around the world. First thing you learn is that they have very high respect for teaching as a profession. Instead of the kind of teacher bashing rhetoric that we have heard so much of in recent years, uh, you hear prime ministers and um, heads of state and everyone else in between talking about how teachers are our lifeblood, they are the thing that matters most in our education system. And then of course they uh, compensate teachers at rates comparable to other college uh, professions, other college uh, degree requiring professions. They do expect that they get career-long commitments with very low attrition. Um, attrition rates in places like um, Finland and Singapore, Ontario, Canada, and so on are somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe 2% a year. In the United States, we've gone up to about 8 or 9%, um, and I'll talk more about that, but reducing attrition matters a great deal. As Rick said earlier, in recent years, we may have had as many as 40% of beginners leaving. Partly that could have been layoffs, but even an earlier study found about 26% of our beginners were leaving, so it's a very large number uh, that uh, really impedes the profession. And there's actually, although there's a lot of talk about will millennials stay in a job more than a couple of years, there's almost no evidence that that is the intention of young people coming into teaching. Uh, and in fact, uh, in general, uh, millennials turn over in a lot of jobs, and particularly in high-tech industries and so on, but, uh, and, and their early career, you know, can I find myself jobs. But in the professions, people are still coming in uh, and staying for the long haul, and in states that have the data, it's clear that most beginning, the vast majority of beginning teachers are um, over the last decade or more, have been coming in and intending to stay and wanting and in fact staying for the long haul. So it's not clear that we should be preparing for a high turnover profession. Certainly that's not the case um, in other countries and it's not the case in states in the U.S. that are paying teachers a decent wage and providing them good working conditions. In general, um, there's in, in historically been uh, few real shortages of people interested in teaching, there are shortages of people interested in working for bad salaries under poor working conditions. And that's, you know, kind of part of the fundamental question. Uh, they also, in all of the countries I named and many others, bring people into high quality preparation programs completely free. And in Finland and Singapore, Korea, other places, you get a stipend or a salary while you're training. So there's no reason that any teacher will ever have less preparation than any other teacher. It's not left to be the amount of preparation you can afford while you're going into debt to enter a career that um, underpay, underpays you. Uh, and this is a hugely valuable um, aspect of the compensation. Guaranteed mentoring and supported induction, including a reduced class size, usually a reduced teaching load, collegial planning opportunities, and then ongoing learning opportunities, including collaborative learning time. So that's, that's a framework for teaching in a lot of places. In fact, in the world, U.S. teachers teach the most instructional hours and have the least collaboration time of teachers anywhere in the world. So our teachers teach face-to-face uh, -face with kids about 27 hours a week. As a professor in higher education, I know for every class hour I teach, I probably spend at least two hours planning, uh, and then another couple of hours you know, giving feedback to students and so on. 
Uh, but our teachers are on an assembly line. Beyond this 27 hours of face time with students, many teachers have hall duty, lunch duty, you know, recess duty, and a variety of other things that leave them pretty much with three to five hours of independent planning time a week and maybe a little bit of time at lunch if they're lucky. Um, the average uh, across the world is 19 hours of face-to-face uh, -face time and in places like, you know, Norway, Finland is in, in that mix as well. It's about 15 hours. Uh, that other time is spent collaborating with other teachers, planning lessons together, being in and out of each other's classrooms, fine-tuning their practice, meeting with parents, meeting with kids individually, doing all of those other things that makes teaching work. So we have challenging contexts for teaching, and in California, as you know, uh, we have a higher uh, pupil-teacher ratio than any other state by 50% uh, as compared to the average, 50% higher. Um, so teachers are also managing more children uh, as well as um, working long hours. So what do California voters think that we should do about the teacher shortage? Um, it, Lewis Friedberg mentioned this earlier this morning, uh, the field poll that EdSource um, and LPI sponsored. Uh, they think that uh, we should offer starting salaries uh, that are comparable to those being offered to their college graduates. This is nine out of 10 voters. Nine out of 10 think we should ensure mentoring and support, should require that teachers um, receive ongoing professional development uh, throughout their careers, uh, should provide opportunities for them to receive a full year of practice teaching under the guidance of an expert teacher like the residency programs provide. Uh, and ensure that all teachers receive rigorous training and preparation before they begin. What they don't believe we should do, a majority believe we should not be just solving this by bringing people in uh, before they've had those opportunities for adequate preparation. So how should we think about what we might do? Uh, number, one of the questions that comes up is, well, what can we do tomorrow? A lot of the solutions have a long-term framework on them. Well, the first thing we should do is keep the teachers we have in the profession in the profession. And that could actually make a big dent. So if you're a local district person, your number one job is to keep the teachers you have. Um, that means you need the mentoring for novices. Whether, whatever pathway they are coming in, they will need support and help. And you can make a big difference um, in retention that way. If 26 to 40 percent of beginning teachers are leaving in five years, uh, the early bits of studies found that that was reduced to uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of five to 10 percent of beginning teachers leaving with very intensive mentoring. In Toronto, where they have a four-year plan for mentoring beginning teachers, beginning teachers leave at the rate of two percent over the first five years. It is possible to build a system that not only recruits people in, but values them when they get there and helps them be able to stay. Uh, you can think about a lot of ways to make teaching affordable. In some districts, it will be a salary question as LCFF dollars are being allocated. And if you're at the low end of the labor market, then you need to be thinking about how to be competitive in that labor market. But in other places, like San Francisco, where they're beginning to put in place housing subsidies for teachers, that's the more important issue. You couldn't possibly raise teacher salaries enough in San Francisco to allow them to buy a house. So they are building housing and creating in Santa Clara County mortgage subsidy, mortgage guarantees, and other things that are really important. Child care can make a difference. Uh, retiree options would be a very interesting way in California to address some of this. Right now, there's a bill that a law that says that if you've retired, you can't earn much if you come back into public service beyond a relatively small amount of money. But it's true that if retirees were allowed to return, whether it's part-time or full-time, and were required to pay into STRS while they are uh, earning money, uh, the, uh, the STRS account would be, it would be revenue neutral. Uh, it would not tax the retirement account because the benefits going back in uh, would, um, would even out in the long run. So there are ways to think creatively about options. 
Uh, another is to obviously address the conditions of teaching and think about um, how to provide collegial time. Many schools have redesigned the way they use time. Um, districts can invest in being sure their principals know how to support teachers in their growth, in their learning, uh, in their opportunities to succeed. Um, teachers always say that the thing that drives them out of the school first is a bad principal, and the thing that attracts them and keeps them is a good one. So that's a really important place uh, to make uh, investments. Stemming attrition would have many benefits. We know that high rates of attrition undermine achievement for all the students in the school. A study that um, Matt Ronfeld and Susanna Loeb does, uh, did uh, quantifies that difference. Each teacher that has to be replaced can cost a district anywhere from fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. Well, what if you spent that money on mentoring and other things that would keep people and make them more effective? Uh, reducing attrition could solve most of the teacher shortage problem. If we cut overall attrition from eight percent, which is the current national average uh, for the whole teaching force, uh, to three percent, which would be closer to international levels, it would reduce our hiring needs each year in half. So you'd be halfway there if you could just keep the teachers you have. Another question is what would bring leavers back? A lot of people have left the profession. There are many credential teachers out there holding credentials, not teaching. Um, and uh, a number of them say that they would come back, particularly if they've less, left in the last five years or so. Um, and what do they say would make a difference? Well, during the era of no teaching positions, the top one was availability of teaching positions. We've got that nailed. We now have teaching positions, so check. Um, but there are a number of things, and I've bracketed the ones that are various forms of compensation. Uh, ability to maintain teaching retirement benefits is a very high ranked uh, attraction. Increase in salary, but also availability of suitable child care, forgiveness of student loans, housing incentives at the bottom there. And then in between, uh, ways to streamline uh, coming back into the profession. Uh, easier and less costly renewal of the certifi certificate. Um, and sometimes there are requirements that teachers encounter, these are national data, um, in trying to renew their certificate. State certification reciprocity, making it easy for teachers to come in from other states. That's a key because we're not only having a shortage here in California, but actually we're part of a national teaching shortage. We may be having the biggest uh, such shortage, uh, size-wise, uh, but it's happening all over the country, and many of you know recruiters from Nevada are here taking California teachers with promises of more affordable housing and whatever it is that you get in Reno and Las Vegas where they have all of the growth. Uh, they probably have all kinds of um, interesting incentives that they can offer. Uh, but we right now don't have a strategy to go out and poach teachers from other states. And there are some states that do have uh, surpluses in some fields, although no, almost nobody has them in um, uh, math, science, and uh, special education and bilingual ESL, but there are states that have more teachers than they have positions, but we don't have a vehicle as we once did to go out and get those teachers and um, help them understand the benefits of coming to teach in California. So all of those are things that we can uh, think about. At the root of the problem is that we need to attract more teachers to high need schools, uh, the ones that I talked about earlier. And it's not going to be uh, only by financial inducements if we were to begin uh, to put those in place. As one National Board Certified Teacher put it um, uh, when asked would he move to a low performing school, he said, I would move, but I would want to see social services for parents and children accomplished leadership, adequate resources and facilities, flexibility, freedom, and time. So the moves that we've had around community schools, around um, uh, you know, principal investments, uh, around school redesign to create good conditions are very important. One of the single greatest factors is principal leadership. Uh, effective administrators are magnets for accomplished teachers. Finally, as an accomplished teacher, my greatest fear is being assigned to a hard-to-staff school and not being given the time and flexibility to make the changes that I believe are necessary to bring about student achievement. So we have to be thinking about this in the long run 
in the context of how we design schools, in the context of how we prepare leaders to lead in schools. California is one of the few states in the country that currently has no investment uh, in the training of school leaders uh, at the state level. We once had California School Leadership Academy. It was one of the programs that was zeroed out in the era of cuts. 20 other states thought that was such a good idea that they borrowed the idea and created their own school leadership academies, which are playing important roles in the process of school turnarounds and implementation of new standards and uh, many other um, issues, including training mentors. So we need to think about the broader view. Uh, but in the short run, what should we do? We should be strategic about recruitment. We could consider reinstating CalTeach, uh, which was uh, a program that recruited people from all over the country to California, had public service announcements, uh, connected uh, teachers to uh, prospective teachers to programs where they could get the training that they were seeking and to the districts that had jobs. Getting into teaching is actually a hard thing to do. If I'm sitting out there in Iowa and I decide I'm going to come to California, i got to figure out, you know, how to uh, find the places that are hiring because we got to make a decision about where to live. I've got to figure out if I have to get re-credentialed or make my credential, uh, is that a word, reciprocal? <laughs> get a reciprocal credential, how to do that. If I'm a young person who has not previously trained, I've got to figure out where do I find a place to do this. It's not easy. We could make that much easier uh, with uh, a small investment uh, in a county office that, or in a set of them that would help us do that recruitment again. I believe that we should be saying, as other countries do, jurisdictions that have the capacity that California does, if you will teach, we will pay for your education. And that ought to be a goal for all teachers, really. But in the short run, we should at least say that to the teachers who are going to prepare in the high need fields, math, science, special ed, bilingual, uh, ELD, uh, and we'll go to the high need locations. Uh, the Apple loans and Calte grants and governor's fellowships were strategies that were very successful in the past um, in getting people to the districts where they were needed. Uh, we need to reinstate some set of incentives and subsidies. As you heard earlier, Although we do have a little bump in the number of people coming into teaching, they're not going into the fields where we most need them. And as you heard from superintendents on the panel, they're not necessarily going to the districts where they are most needed either. And we have no incentives right now to steer the prospective teaching force to the places where they're needed. Uh, so we will have a lot of diseconomies if we don't figure out how to do that. We could support early pipelines into teaching. We have a mammoth career pathways program in California, $500 million going to career pathways, um, and many, many places to create teaching pathways for high school students to begin to, like they do with medical academies and health sciences academies and so on, begin to consider teaching. A very easy thing to do, it just requires existing money to be made available for these kinds of academies. There were 80 places in the state that proposed uh, such a proposal last year, um, and we need to, and it was not accepted, we need to think about that. Many districts have grow your own programs. We've heard about helping paraprofessionals, for example, get on the pathway uh, to be able to come into special education. All of those uh, have track records, we know how to do it, we've got uh, evidence and research. We should also invest in successful preparation. Uh, we should really think about how to create a California teacher corps with teacher residencies like those we heard about in high need communities. By the way, we could tap a lot of federal money if we did that uh, because there is AmeriCorps resources there, teacher quality partnership grants. Uh, we could create a matching uh, program between the state and districts. And what's wonderful about this approach, like the California, like the teacher corps of the past, is that it actually solves the problem of getting people prepared to teach effectively in high-need communities.
because you learn from the very best expert teachers. Because there's something different about teaching in a rural community, in a high need urban community. There's a lot to know, there's more to know. But if you can learn from the very, very best for a full year, get your credential and pledge to stay, you've disrupted the vicious cycle that we so often have and you've created a virtuous cycle in which a talented, diverse, well-trained group of people stays and becomes leaders in the districts uh, where they are most needed. Uh, we need to expand undergraduate options uh, for preparation. We can do that. Uh, we've traditionally had graduate level post-baccalaureate training, but we've opened the door. The legislature has helped remove the cap on training that was a barrier. The CTC has removed the strictures on the nature of the work that can be done there in a way that we could make a lot of progress. Grab those young people while they're paying for undergraduate school. Uh, help them, uh, incentivize them, but get those blended special education programs, those blended bilingual ELD uh, and uh, either multiple subject or single subject programs planted and get people going uh, because it's a wasted resource. It's a whole period of time that's not being used in most California universities right now. Where might we get the money? I know you're thinking that question. <laughs> That's always the question. Well, the Workforce Investment Act actually is federal money that can be used to address workforce shortages. It was used some years ago for the nursing shortage. And according to Mary Sandy, it seems to have worked because she told that story about all the great pathway into nursing. $460 million a year comes to California. Some of it goes local, a little bit stays at the state level. It's discretionary. And it could be used to support both local strategies and state teacher education investments. Uh, we just had a $490 million allocation from the legislature last year in a sort of professional development block grant, which can be used for beginning teacher mentoring and residencies and learning supports. Uh, Proposition 98 and LCFF funds can be deployed for programs that are in local counties or districts like CalTeach or teacher residency programs, and of course, compensation and working conditions. Federal funds are available and not being tapped by California nearly as much as they could be to supplement scholarships and teacher residencies. Uh, at the end of the day, I just want to reinforce that in the ambitious changes we're undertaking in California, new standards, new accountability systems, new ways of allocating funding, community engagement in the budgeting process, all of that work that we're embarked on at the end of the day rests on the people in the schools uh, who are there trying to do the best job they can do. All of them want to be as skillful and expert as they can be. And at the end of the day, our future depends on supporting the profession on which all other professions in this state depend. Thank you.